You ready? The intro is playing in my head right now. <laughs> hey, Biko. Hey, Ban. I thought you were going to start me off easy. Singing soprano in high school isn't really the sort of thing that gives you credibility. Halfway into a pandemic, I was like, this is a great time to start meeting strangers. I had not done a short film. I had not done anything. I'd recommend the one chapter that captures all my romantic exploits. Kenya knows what to do with people who give you what we know. How do I like to enjoy my single turn? A little bit of water, just a splash. I like it neat. I like preserving the integrity. Oh, whiskey should be taken neat. One ice. <sighs> well, there's, there's uh, glimmers and vignettes now and again. I think what I recognize is the, is the drive. When I started to play in high school, I was often the smallest person on the pitch, but I also had other passions. I, I wanted to be part of the school musical. And this is just a few days after I joined this, this high school. You know, when you, when you join Saints, um, at least at that time, if you weren't careful, you'd suffer very heavily from imposter syndrome. So I walk in and there are all of these guys who I recognized from the rugby field. Some are my older brother's friends, some are my sister's friends and are all older than me gathered around this piano. And I sang, the room being fairly loud and then quieting down. And you know, when you have everybody's attention on you, you kind of feel their eyes on you. And by the time I was done, so they, they clapped and, and they were excited and, and I kind of knew that I got the part. But, you know, singing soprano in high school and being part of a musical um, isn't really the sort of thing that gives you credibility on, on those streets. I very quickly became the subject of a lot of bullying. At first it was playful, but then it became more mean-spirited. Um, the guys who are bigger than me stronger than me, would often try and pick on me. The bullying became so intense. Um, and I never told my older brother about it. I never told anyone about it. But the bullying became so intense that I, you know, I wanted to leave the school and I wanted to just go somewhere else where I could be anonymous. But my, my Mze was like, why do you want to leave this school? It's a good school, you know, and he was right. And I had a small meeting with myself and thought, what else can I do? to be able to get away from this, to escape from this. Because class had become incredibly uncomfortable and painful and every session there, there'd be something, you know, for someone to pick on me for. And there it was, it was rugby field. I was small, I was young, but I was determined. And I went onto the field um, to practice a couple of times. But my brother who was on the, on the, the second team at the time told me not to play because I was too small and so I had to bide my time. And the following year I came back, I wasn't much bigger, but that seed had been planted that I didn't want to be the object of, of ridicule. Myself and um, my now business partner, who we were in high school with, um, were the only two Form 2s to be selected for the first team in the final of the Prescott Cup and I was there. I kind of fell into it. Short story. When I joined the newsroom, I had a very, very clear idea that I was not going to tell stories just for the sake of it. My father had been in a public glare for something that he didn't do. He was, you know, doing a great job. He and some of the people in that firm wound up in court and I remember sitting with him in court and somewhere in the back was a journalist. The following day, I read the story that that journalist had written. It was completely different. My father specifically and my family suffered for that. When I started doing journalism, I thought to myself, I'd be very clear that 
I am going to try and do things and do them right. And I'm not just going to tell stories just to tell them. Sometime in 2006, just slightly after I jo joined KTN, this young guy, light-skinned, Ethiopian, Somali looking, I couldn't quite place him, joins the newsroom. And uh, <laughs> the first, one of the first days of him being there, uh, he tries to sell me shoes. This, of course, is Muhammad Ali. The thing that I love about Moha is he has an instinct for stories and a nose for news like very few journalists that I've ever seen. And here I am with this guy who has this very interesting nose for news and is a people person par excellence. Um, we start doing a couple of small stories together. This opportunity to tell this whale of a story comes and Moha it comes across Moha's desk first, and he's asked, who do you want to do it with? And uh, Moha says, me. And my boss is like, Shh, no. him? No. You know, go ni babi. You understand? I, don't, I think he just didn't think that I, I could do it or I had the chops for it, but Moha insisted. I guess because he had also seen something in me. And so that's how I fell into investigative reporting. Kind of haven't looked back since. Has my life turned out the way I thought it would? No, it hasn't. I, I don't think for anybody it ever turns out exactly in that way. There was this advertisement when we were growing up and there was this question that was being asked to kids. When I grow up, I want to be... There was this kid in a big brown suit and he said, when I grow up, I want to be the president. And I was like, that has a very nice ring to it. I want to be the president. And so for a while there, I thought, yeah, rice, Mtukufu, John Alan Namu, Leo Yuana Ingia Wanja, Amevasuti Ile Ile, stuff like that. Um, but as I played rugby, I felt determined that I could be like a professional rugby player. So that kind of went away. And so by the time I got to university, I wasn't absolutely certain. But there had been instances in my past, in my life, that were leading me down a path that I eventually chose, which was journalism. One of those instances was when we drive around town with my dad, maybe he's going to work or, you know, we have a random weekend and I happen to be in the car with him. He'd have me read uh, the newspaper. This is back in, in primary school. I was in standard four, standard five, the 90s. And there'd be things like that that would happen along, you know, my growing up that would drive me further and further and further towards um, or rather closer towards um, journalism. To try and stop living a lie. How I, you know, got to st stop living a lie or stop in part, because we, we all lie to ourselves, <laughs> was um, when um, my now wife fell pregnant. And when she fell pregnant, I had a choice to make. Do I ask her to get rid of the baby? Do I accept that I have indeed made this lady pregnant and there's a child coming? Suffice to say, I made the right decision, but after a long, long time. So when McKenna and I were having this thing, um, I was still in a relationship. Um, but at the same time, I was kind of, you know, making moves in my career. I had since met up with my very dear friend, Muhammad Ali. That year, we had done some really heavy stories because that was the year of the post-election violence. That was an important year for the country. And it was when I did in my earlier, in my early career, some, I, I believe, of my finest work. And so it was at this point in time when you know, things are starting to pick up and I have this public persona that's building. I have to confront the fact that I am not as perfect as I have projected myself to be. Social media was not as big as it was then. The public scrutiny I felt because of my decisions would have been, you know, a thousandfold. Again, you know, God, God works in mysterious ways. One of the stories or two of the stories that I did in 2008 would the following year earn me um, a CNN award. But 
one story that we did in 2009 really launched our careers as investigative journalists. Now that story sent us into hiding. And it was at the same time that I was thinking about this lady whom I feel very deeply for but never quite admit. So that was very difficult. But I'm very thankful that I went through that that period in time because I now have an 11-year-old son who makes me proud and three other children and a life and a wife that I'm I'm very thankful to have. There's pressure, yes. And and it does transform us in many ways um, because when you're up there, when you're out there and people know who you are and perhaps you're on a public stage somewhere, there's this false morality that you must sort of like put on and become part of you. And so you can never put a foot wrong. You can never be imperfect. You can never get things wrong. And when you do, you are judged harshly for it, perhaps more harshly than if you were just a regular person. And people who tell you that sitting on a stage somewhere does not change who they are, lie. They lie. Yeah, so in the year 2011, I just moved to the nation, um, trying to you know, find myself as a journalist and, you know, develop my skill set. And I felt that the nation was the best place to do it. And I had a couple of really good stories and good runs. And, and that December, a source of mine comes and he tells me this fantastical story about Felician Kabuga and how he's in the country. And I'm like, this is a story worth telling. We go out, we start following his trail, picking up clues here and there. And I go back and I share my evidence with my boss. It goes to the editorial board committee. The story is watched seven times, at least if I remember, seven times. And there were changes here, tweaks here, that there, blah, blah, blah. Going through line by line, every bit of evidence that I have. And then I start to receive threats. Some of my sources have been threatened. And this had happened earlier, that there, were, there was disquiet and two months, for two months while I was doing the story here, my wife and um, my two children at the time were in a safe house with me. I had to pull them out of kindergarten, which wasn't a big deal, but my wife had to leave work to take care of them, which was a big deal. You know, she went on leave for the first month, then unpaid leave for the second month. The threats ramped up Kidogo. And just as, as we were releasing the story, we took off to another country and she's going into month three. While we were in hiding, she loses her job. And just, so we left the Friday before the story ran. So the story runs and from what I'm getting, the message is ETC. There's a huge reaction about it. Like people are very upset about Kabuga Sojan in Kenya and more so the fact that there, were, there was a role that was being played and then I get a call from a contact in the military, in the communications department. And uh, he was unusually calm because I was worried about picking up the phone. He's like, hi, John, how are you? This is another Monday after. And he's like, um, are you in town? Um, there's a press conference at the police, um, the, at the police headquarters. Press conference at the police headquarters? Why aren't the police notifying us? He's like, oh, you just come. So later on, I watch, you know, the news bulletin and it has that as one of the stories. And here's this man wearing the exact same T-shirt that I had in that photograph. And it's a gentleman, a businessman from Misiolo. And uh, it hit me very hard. Because, you know, when I got into this profession, like I said, I wanted to do things right. This was by far, up until that point, the biggest story I'd ever done. And I got it wrong. My wife who was there was a huge pillar of support for me. So that was my burning house moment. Today, today. Uh, today I'm, uh, I'm a full 10. 
Uh, so uh, I don't drink much. It was a drink like a singleton. Uh, I like it neat. Small story. My mom says that I drink whiskey exactly the way her dad used to. So with a thoughtfulness that I don't make up, it just comes from my face. So I like it neat. <laughs>